Muchas gracias, Maria. Uh, that's very kind of you. Um, being the first non-Spanish speaker here this morning, can you hear me? All right. Uh, so being the first non-Spanish speaker here this morning gives me the special duty to thank the uh, organizers indeed for inviting me. I've always looked at Sevilla and the region of Andalusia as a truly global region mm -hmm. with uh, 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 such a rich heritage with Christopher Columbus and the uh, interaction between two of the major religions on earth, yes, the Islam uh, and the Christianity. Uh, well, and indeed also the rich natural environment uh, the rich natural environment with the river Guadalquivir uh, uh, and the Doñana National Park. And it's always fascinating. And I think from now on I will also consider this region as a circular economy region, which is indeed great. Um, I have managed, oh great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, well, plus a city and an organizer of great capabilities. Thanks for uploading my presentation. So, uh, in fact, when we look at today's world, uh, the world is truly global again. And at the same time, the world is very fragmented. And we can look at natural resources as a symbol of the fragmentation in this world. When we look at the different ambitions by which people treat natural resources, we see many resource-rich regions in the world, and Africa would be one of them, Australia would be another one, where there are clear development perspectives with the exploitation, the extraction, and the export of natural commodities. At the same time, we also see the manifold geopolitical ambitions that in particular the large powers of the world uh, wish to have access to resources and wish to exert their power on how the neighbors might use less of those resources should the great powers wish them to do so. And indeed we have the concern of business in how they are able to deal and access natural resources. And right in the middle we then have the issue squeezed a bit about the environmental concerns and the other issues which indeed, in a way, is also reflected in what we've seen in the commodity market in the last years. We certainly had a boom from the year 2000 to 2012-13, but the prices are now declining, and they have been declining very sharply, partly thanks to the shale gas revolution in the US, which was by and large unexpected. Most people at that time spoke of peak oil, and then all of a sudden we had new oil, new unconventional oil, unconventional gas coming in the market. And these surprises are probably what characterizes commodity market these days. If you ask me now, what is the oil price of tomorrow? What is the likely commodity price in five years from now? Uh, not even I, and I'm not the brightest person on earth, I guess, would have any clue of what is the direction in which it develops. My best hunch is is that probably the energy prices will stay low for quite a while, probably not in the long run. But food prices and metal prices, they are more likely to develop in a different and more upward-oriented direction because the scarcities, the constraints are just more tight on metals and food compared to energy. So that's all interesting. And indeed, then, we look at the climate change issues that have been negotiated in climate and fortunately led to an agreement that now forces us to reduce CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gases. And if we needed any example of how a linear economy just leads into a wrong direction, here it is. We dump greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so we misuse the atmosphere as a landfill site, so to say. So we certainly also need to forward to a more circular type of economy there. But coming from environmental research, I would also like to just shed a short light on what is called the planetary boundaries, where Earth system scientists gather evidence on what other Earth system boundaries uh, are likely to be transgressed. And two of them, uh, two other besides climate change, which are important for the conference here, are the nutrient boundaries for phosphorus and for nitrogen. Um, well, along with the biosphere integrity issue, 
where we look at biosphere losses, biodiversity losses, but the whole way of how land usually is being used or misused land that is ultimately physically scarce and need to be managed in a better way, in particular through the large users of forestry and agriculture. And with it, we also discover uh, in research the debate about the nexus, that the resources, the use of resources indeed interact. We can't use energy without using water, without using materials, and the same also goes for the water energy food nexus. This is important, and certainly when it comes to managing re those resources, we also have to apply circular economy thinking across the silos of different management organizations. There is no way of just managing energy without co-managing water, and there is no way of managing water without looking at the energy bill. So this then is a bigger picture, and this is not often seen in the environmental debate, but I think it is very much around in your minds and in I a public media indeed, which is the security di uh, discussion. When we look at many of the conflict zones of today, we discover that quite often resources, access to resources, the use of resources is one of the underlying drivers. We can uh, witness it in the eastern Ukraine, we can witness it along the uh, Asian rivers, we can also witness it in the South China Sea where China builds artificial islands to extend mm -hmm. its land to claim the law of the sea to be in their favor to do what? Well, to control shipping lanes, basically, and to access resources. So these underlying drivers also very much speak in favor of using resources in a much more circular manner. Um, which then altogether confronts us with risk of what has been labeled as a perfect storm. We not only have the future risk of climate change, and I must say, when I was younger and started to look at these issues, we really thought this is a uh, second half of the 21st century type of debate, and it's not. We realize that climate change is there. But when we put it together with these regional security repercussions, we really realize that we are at a dangerous conjecture where some parts of the world where nuclear weapons are around, where the people are willing to use their guns, where gunboat diplomacy uh, quickly can turn into a warlike situation. This is a perfect storm scenario where uh, we may see more uh, unsurprising, uh, unpleasant events coming up uh, uh, than we might uh, think there should be. And this indeed reminds us again to the rich history of the region here, but also to Europe's own history in the 20th century. So that's all quite uh, one of the reasons. So what is one of the bigger goals that has been uh, passed uh, international legislation, the sustainable development goals that have been launched, well, in a way, in parallel with the climate change conference last year, they are interesting. They come with a number of targets, but uh, when you start looking at those sustainable development goals in more detail, uh, we also realize that m to fulfill those goals, to end hunger, to fight poverty, to allow access to water, uh, to have a more civilized urbanization. This all likely comes with using more resources. We will use more mineral fertilizers to feed the world. We will use more energy and materials to set up a water distribution infrastructure. So aligning those different resource needs towards what is also called for in goal 12 as a sustainable production and consumption model, again, will require tough hard efforts and thinking across the silos of just looking at my goal. I am the hunger fighter. I need to feed the world without eventually then looking at the energy, the water, and the other repercussions. So this holistic type of thinking is pretty much important. And indeed, it also reminds us to the different urban challenges. So this is a picture of London uh, quite some time ago. And indeed, also the vast array of energy and resources used through urban areas throughout the world. Um, all right. So in a nutshell, 
the circular economy that uh, has been mentioned in the first presentation is about doing these things in a much more holistic manner to create jobs for, uh, uh, for international supply chains to also become more resilient, to be able to cope with the uh, uncertainties ahead of us on international commodity markets and on international product markets. And indeed to also be able to look at innovation and eco-innovation in a more systemic manner. Um, and here's a diagram that some of you might not really be able to see in the back uh, of this uh, audience here, but it portrays a more holistic approach to using all materials. And uh, the methodology also points at the beginning, the traceability not only of waste, but of all resources. And when you then do the calculation of how much of all the resources used throughout societies are currently being recycled, the share, the quota, is much lower than the official estimation which is based on solid municipal waste. Therefore, it is indeed interesting and also fascinating to develop a methodology, and the methodology here is established, it is used by OECD, it is not yet fully applied to circular economy thinking, but the take home message, I guess, is that we can do even better with using all resources in a more sustainable manner, uh, manner and not just starting with the production of waste, but translating the waste hierarchy, the principle of waste avoidance into principles of sustainable resource management, beginning with mining, beginning with extraction, beginning with refinery, and then going through all the supply chains, going through all the value chains to do what? To create more value for the citizens. And this indeed then also leads to the macroeconomic gains that have been mentioned. We just finished a calculation here based on a macroeconomic model and the mechanism basically works as follows. Doing resource efficiency, doing the circular economy allows us to cut the purchase of material costs including water, including energy. Uh, this basically means that we bring jobs back home, jobs that have been generated in the mining countries, in the large manufacturing hubs of the world and bring these jobs back to Europe because it is just wiser to cut the material bill by doing it here. <coughs> not in all circumstances, not as a sort of generalist principle, but more as a tendency. And if you put that into a model and we develop a scenario which we called Europe goes alone, uh, thinking that probably Europe is still spearheading the rest of the world in terms of circular economy, CO2 reduction, and not all of the uh, regions are likely to follow outside Europe, some of them may, but then if we put it together, we do have a job machine, maybe not as spectacular as we wish it should be, but the job creation then also generates more revenues, which is good news for the reduction of public debts, and then also lead to a number of other macroeconomic benefits. Um, <coughs> and examples are around. I'm pretty sure this is just a sort of an eye-catcher and we will learn so much more about the promising examples in a number of regions here. The region I would eventually like to shortly highlight is Lingang, which is a region close to Shanghai. They are now creating a new city for 500,000 people entirely based on low-carbon circular economy. They will bring the major manufacturers of the world into the area their families will live there, they will test the new products being developed there and showcase them for the rest of the world. So this is what I would call a promising experiment. It is large scale because it is China. <coughs> so China just does these things and we certainly can cooperate. And here I just would like to share with you that also in research of change, the transition management approach, it all starts with developing niches, with doing experiments, with people coming together, with small-scale business uh, doing these things in niches and then gradually moving forward, upgrading it, upscaling it by means of institutionalizations, by bright policies, uh, indeed facilitated by the European Commission and by other means. I'm now coming to an end. What, is, uh, what comes next? 
I do think there is a great scope in having better knowledge, better data about what exists out there, not just data about waste, but also in particular data about what we call the anthropogenic stocks. So what is around in the capital goods, in the goods that are being produced, eventually also in the buildings. Look at these sources as the resources of the future. The whole idea of the circular economy package uh, aiming inter alia to boost the market for secondary resources should start with having information about what is around. So creating a knowledge base on these things certainly is one of the uh, most important issues. I'm glad to learn that it's on the way, but certainly then gaining access to these data and make it reliable and make it used, that's probably the challenge of the next years. Uh, then indeed also engagement, where this is one of the regional cornerstones, I would think, of the organizers here, but we have to do it throughout Europe. We have to connect also with other parts of the world. So getting it done here is probably a very, very promising step forward. And indeed then the major task is to upscale it from what we have called in our expert group from niches to norm to really make it a mass market development where business indeed is a key next to region that even those businesses that currently rely on a more linear type of economy discover the fascinating opportunities of creating new value through, re uh, through resources in a different way. And you would think that the food supply chains, the metal supply chains, they are probably the next generation of business models that just can change to become more circular compared to the today's models. Um, and indeed also I would like to, well, just mention once more to hand it over to the next speaker, the circular economy package in Europe, but also point, and this leads me back to the great tradition of the region here, to the global opportunities and the global necessities to liaise with other parts of the world, and Ling Gang might be one of them, and I really look forward to a fascinating conference. Thank you very much indeed.